Hello, David Zritsky for The Bond Experience. Welcome back. I am here with a gentleman that I think many of you may recognize. And if you don't recognize the face, you'll recognize the name. If you don't recognize the name, you'll definitely recognize his impact in our community. Ben Collins, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. Good to see you too. Absolutely. And one of the things that we should start off with is for the uh, horribly uninitiated, um, you know, some people know you from different avenues. So some may know you as the SIG, obviously from Top Gear, where, my gosh, you've you've raced and pitted a lot of celebrities against uh, some very really harrowing challenges, haven't you? Yeah, I had a lot of fun in the, in the Top Gear days. So that was um, with the white helmet on as the SIG. Um, so not not many people got to um, know much more about um, about me from those days until um, until until the end of that period. And um, while I was there, we had a great time with the particularly the stars in the cars doing the reasonably priced car challenge. Um, and so I got to meet a lot of the you know really cool actors who subsequently I got to work with on on the big screen as well as um, TV. So, but that was a, an amazing grounding. So that's really what where I learned the ropes of, of film production and. Um, how the, the camera guys would um, set up the shots and and the editing process, all that good stuff. So it was, was brilliant. And um, obviously got my hands on a lot of amazing machinery over that time. So I got to log a huge catalog of different um, types of car and how they work and really good uh, good times. I love how you called it an initiation because you're right. There was so much mystery shrouded in the stig. And then when that was unveiled, I mean, you really became and, and were and are uh, the go-to guy in Hollywood for a lot of these things. And then, of course, you know, pertinent to my channel, The Bond Experience, and my audience, you've done a lot of work in the world of Bond, which we'll definitely talk about. But I think it's great that you and I can finally connect because you did something I'm going to call a passion project. And mm -hmm. sometimes with passion projects, we don't always get to experience them. But this is a moment where we can. You wrote a book. Yeah. And it's really Aston Martin made in Britain. And I will tell you something very transparently. I've had 36 hours with this book and that's it. So I started to think to myself, all right, I'm gonna do a strafing run. And I actually wound up reading it from cover to cover. No small oh, feat in 36 hours. Thank you, that's a, that's, a, that's a marathon. It was a marathon, but I couldn't, and I'll tell you why I couldn't put it down. And then I wanna hear about your inspiration behind it. I expected that it was gonna be a very technical, almost overly historical discussion of Aston Martin. What I found is your writing style is very much like Ian Fleming. You are so immersive in taking the reader and giving them that what I call writing surround sound of smells, emotions, experiences, ups and downs. Where did the inspiration come from putting this down on paper? Well, that's very high praise and I'm a huge fan of Ian Fleming's writing. And um, so, well, I mean, I I wanted to write the book that I would want to read, <clears throat> and um, Aston Martin's history it's it's pretty huge. So I've I've got um, a li some limited experience of of driving their cars over the years, and um, that was that was something I could bring to to the sort of the concept of writing a book about the the, the brand if, or the company, the people. Um, but it became apparent to me that w when I came to write it and research the do, you know, months of sort of background research. That really the best thing to do is to make a, to focus on the big personalities and there's so many in the in the history that um so in a way it's a series of, of linked biographies and they these wonderful people these characters weave their way in and out of each other's other's lives through the through that time from the very early days and i, I just love the way that these stories are all interconnected from lionel martin meeting count zabrowski the 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 sort of eccentric inventor of chitty bang bang um, that inspired Ian Fleming as a boy and later became a film. And um, how Ian Fleming's um, part in the whole Aston Martin story is all linked to the very early days of, of motorsport in the 1920s. So um, I just kept finding these lovely links. And of course, when you look back um, at your life, everything seems to have followed a course and you, you are where you are because of it. But, um, you know, as they would have lived it, nobody knew what was going to happen next. And even down to the early days of the company, there was no definition of of transport. It, there was um, there was the horse, then there was a bicycle, and then well, I guess it should have four wheels and an engine. Um, that's really where um, Aston Martin was was forged was in the very early days. But they just did something very special from the beginning, and I think um, that connects it too. But uh, but really the the engineering side I was fascinated in, but only as much as it was an extension of these personalities and the way they approached problems. 
So um, I had a lot of fun um, learning more about these people that um, in a way were strangers to me until I and got to know them through reading their biographies and going into libraries and digging out information. And well, I want to mention something from a reader's point of view, because obviously you wrote the book. We're talking about it now from a reader's point of view. What I loved about this is you put it through the filter of yourself, even though you're talking about 100 years, 100 years of Aston Martin. You really start off and bookend the entire book with Ben's experience. I love the chapter. And this is when I knew it was a very different book. I love the chapter on expensive socks. The yeah. whole idea that, you know, the wink and nod, because I had this with my dad with James Bond. You know, yeah. my dad would come into the room and he wasn't the guy in the back, you know, that would play baseball with me. But when there was a James Bond film on TV, he'd say, hey, David, um, I need your help with something in the garage. And we'd watch Bond films. This to me was our upbringing, you know, the, the, the whole idea of them going out for socks and then sitting in the Aston Martin and the experience of your dad gripping the wheel and your excitement. I mean, that had to that had to spur things on for your the rest of your life. Well, I a shared experience with you, very similar. Um, so, um, at the, you know, my dad was away a lot working, but um, at the weekends he'd be around and um, in between sort of sporting and motoring um, out, outward bound activity, if, the, if there was a Bond film on, that everything would stop and we'd go and watch that. So that's just how it was. And, um, you know, he was very much a self-made guy. And I think that a lot of people just go weak at the knees when they get around one of these cars. I mean, they're they're achingly beautiful to look at <clears throat> and in the example of the socks that was typical of, of my dad you know we'd go out um ostensibly to buy so, um, some sort of sock buying mission but i guess once he was off and, and you know he it, he decided yeah well we'll go a little bit further and we'll get to a car dealership and just see what's around um which is when we, we came across the um this brooding monster that was parked up and um either deliberately or not <clears throat> they fired it up as we were walking past and it just made this um, incredible burble. The, the the thumping V8 in that thing was just an absolute beast. Um, and it was a very stirring thing to hear. It was, and I likened it to um, an air show that I saw when I was four Sorry. with the Vulcan bomber with these you know, enormous engines um, that just was, the air was crackling around you. It was so loud. Um, in car form, the, the vantage of the day was a similar kind of beast. Um, so I, that was a, a shared experience. I was a teenager. He sat in it and that was the end of that, you know, um, any any sense of, um, you know, negotiation on the on the price or anything was just out the window. You know, it was the car he'd saved his saved up his entire life for. So um, that was it. He dumped the company car in the lot and went home. We went home with it. Um, of course, the reality of um, these dreams come true is is a different thing. And um, the, the handling qualities of the Vantage were. Was, were debatable, um, but there's no doubt that it was an absolute, it was a monster. Um, so, you know, the T-Rex of the motoring world. Um, I, I eventually got my own hands on it, um, only when he decided that it, it, he was, he'd had enough of, of the machine because it was, um, it, it misbehaved. The headlights steamed up, the dashboard um, started to fall apart a little bit. Yeah. Um, and um, he fell out of love, which was my opportunity to get in the behind the wheel. Uh, for a couple of spirited journeys and um you really it was all hands on deck to drive that thing it was um such a big big monster um but i love then finding out you know for all of its unruliness it was a real thug of a car it cracked me up that jackie stewart was the um the, the test and development driver for it because jackie's such a, 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 a um, an organized and everything is just so with him the way he he goes about his testing and stuff but ultimately um, the design element was um, done by the engineers and he had to make the best of it. And um, the end was as polished as you could make it. It's interesting because as I was reading this, I mean, it, and, and this is important for the reader to be, it's really a chronological journey. I mean, it's not like, you know, I, I think what's interesting for the Bond fans, for example, you embed Bond during different moments in Bond, even starting in the 1950s, which I found really fascinating. And then, of course, you know, from 2008 to 2020, you get this bolus dose because of your experience. I, two years ago, and I found so much commiserating with you on this in a positive way. Two years ago, I purchased a 2006 uh, Vantage V8. And... Love it to this day. It's a honey of a car. It's so distracting in the garage. I find myself wandering out to it for no apparent reason. But as I was sitting in that car two years ago, I had almost the same type of experience. What you did was you pound, you you really did put down a historical perspective 
of the emotion, uh, the survival, the innovation, even the style of these cars. So I think some people may think, oh, is it a historical recounting of Aston Martin? Yes, that's in there. Absolutely. The trials and tribulations, Ferrari situation. But I think also what you put in there is what, what was potentially going through the minds of these people leading up to you. Yes. Uh, well, I, I'm glad you think that. And, you know, um, I love all, all the different um, the angles we can look at. For But I think um, I was also fascinated in the origins of um, the Bond character and Ian Fleming's take on, on how he was going to write that. Um, so I was very fortunate that um, the Ian Fleming Trust, were, they, they had some fantastic anecdotes from from the past. Um, as well as other things that I just sort of stumbled across um, that uh, he, as a boy, used to go to Brooklands as a kid. Um, uh, and when Chitty Bang Bang came flying around the banking at 90 miles an hour, it, the, the surface was uneven and the car took off. So it flew past where he was standing. And I'm sure his jaw would have hit the floor, as, a, as would all little boys seeing this thing. But the car flew past him and the, the idea of the, the flying car stuck. And then his imagination took it into another another realm. Um, but um, but I really enjoyed learning about his his time during World War Two with the Admiralty and and working on these um, spying missions and counter espionage and um, so the Operation Mincemeat working with commandos to to you know confuse the enemy and uh, coming up with these really um, outlandish plans um, but particularly um, his role with um, commandos and the this so is the origin of commandos um, during World War Two. And how really that was the prototype of, of the Bond character that he would then write. Um, and wonderfully how um, his con con early concept of the Operation Mincemeat program, where they um, used the, um, the fictitious sort of story of a dead airman to, um, a dead major, sorry, to um, convince the Germans that um, about or to mislead them as to the Allied invasion of Sicily and um, make them think it was Greece. So, I really enjoyed um, learning about all that, and then by serendipity, there's um, the the uh, one of the the driver that takes the the dead body up to Scotland to go into the submarine to go out to the um, Spain um, was an Aston Martin driver. So you couldn't make it up that there was a real life spy who um, was an Aston Martin racing driver, all linked in with um, with Ian Fleming's work. Um, so I think it's great that these stories overlap the way they do, and um, tells us a lot about you know. The, like these iconic movies that are based on um, a sort of a, a real life concept. Absolutely. And what, by the way, as, as you're saying this, this is part of my process when I was reading the book is, who is this book for? I mean, and I'm sure you thought about that as you were writing, uh, because I think the mistake could be made is, oh, it's car enthusiasts or Aston Martin enthusiasts. It's actually people that love history, love stories, love branding, love marketing. I mean, it really does fall the echelon and entertainment and movie making so it does yeah. cover a lot of bases in here absolutely I, I mean i'm not an overly technical person so i i understand um the the you know the part the elements that um, that affect me and uh, and um, i am interested in in how things work um but i didn't um, absolutely didn't want to write um uh, there are better far better books that have real chapter and verse on the, on the technical aspects of um the the engineering details on each car but i think there's an expression that's um, involved in in the people that that have um pioneered the the tech so there are there are stories of the de development of the thing you know from the very basic of uh how i mean it it seems ridiculous that they ever had cars that only had brakes that on the, on the rear wheels, but there were reasons for it back in the day. And um, Aston Martin was one of the first companies to have braking on all four wheels as if this was some sort of big revelation. But um, but thanks to Akiri Batelli, I got to go out and drive one of their 1920s um, machines. And um, when you drive that car and you see the chassis and you can you can take the chassis with your hands and bend the rails in, they're so they're so soft and squidgy. Um, to suit the conditions that they were working in the, in the days. Um, and when you put a braking force through the car, the whole thing twists and starts moving around. So you kind of understand what they mm. were dealing with, um, the, the metal work and just the technology that as it, as it sort of um, slowly started to make progress. So I do find it fascinating the way the, the baton has been handed from one successive generation to the next. Um, and that continuously, really, Aston Martin has been at the forefront of that that pursuit of perfectionism, and they have been the avant-garde of development with road cars, um, particularly lightweight sports cars. That's their real specialty. Um, 
and even now I can't there is there's nobody that does it better with a front engine GT than Aston they 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 seem to have kept that magic in the bottle and um they relentlessly keep um tweaking and perfecting and so now we've used the word vantage um a few times so there's the the 1990s the one that you own um but now this the modern car i think probably is the best car they've ever made and um they have the same name they share many of the same qualities but very very different um as time's gone on the, the what these things are capable of but it's like a it's a complete it's a supercar in a in a small package isn't it i don't know if you've got to drive the new the new one but um it's a an incredible weapon I actually did. I, I went to my, there was a big uh, brouhaha here in a positive way at my local dealership. So they had everybody came, plied them with a, a light amount of champagne and canopies and on you go. It was great. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> that's why I said a light amount of champagne. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, maybe just look at it. Um, that's, yeah, that's awesome. It's an amazing piece of kit. I mean, there's now these sort of two lines of the slightly um, bigger car, the DB line and, um, and the Vantage, the, the V cars. Um, but, um, but it's amazing to watch them go. And, and now, of course, they're breaking out into the SUV side with the DBX and uh, and the ultra hypercar um, with um, Adrian Newey's new wonders. So, yeah, it's exciting times for the for the business. You, you mentioned Vantage quite a bit in the film. Uh, sorry, the uh, the book. You noticed something as soon as I sat down today. I mean, I totally yeah. geeked out and I, I wore the shirt. And a part of that, and believe me, I, I vacillated between not wearing it, but uh, the reason I did is because there's a call out in the book where you talk about um, sort of the vantage, non-vantage, yeah. you know, the whole idea of like, hold on a second. Was that the fact that it was an Aston V8 Volante, but they were putting vantage badges on it? Is that? Yeah. So, I mean, I was very keen to be accurate and um, I was very fortunate that the wonderful people at Aston Martin. Firstly, I got to do a ton of interviews, so um, I was really glad to bring something new because I, I read a lot of books about Aston Martin, and but I wanted to bring fresh perspective. So my experiences, okay, that's one thing, but um, I got to interview uh, Nick Fry, uh, Ian Callum. So Nick, who was working at Ford and was brought in to overhaul and restructure the manufacturing process when Ford bought Aston Martin and made mm-hmm. it the company it is today, really. Um, he, he gave me these wonderful first-hand anecdotes, <clears throat> but also um, the, the people who are working at Aston Martin today, they gave freely of their time, and I, I got to really um, hone down a lot of, lot of things. And things that I accepted as being completely true um, fact, um, I realized I was, as I was setting the information down, they were correcting me on stuff. And it is quite addictive, um, fact-checking stuff, and really... I suppose there's probably going to be only well I may be I may be doing an injustice to to the real Aston Martin gurus out there um, there's probably a hundred people that could unpick some of these facts but I want to write it so that they can look at this and think yes that is historically accurate because a lot of stuff was um, uh, I suppose went has gone astray with some of the things that have been written so the archivist um, helped me nitpick through the information and one of the um, bugbears I think for um, some of the guys at Aston Martin is that the Aston Martin in the living daylights is referred to as a Vantage. Yes. And it was a it was a winterized Volante, not a Vantage. Right. Because um, Q famously takes the car um, and sticks a roof on it, basically. Um, and originally, I think it was um, Victor Gauntlet, who was um, the chief exec of, of Aston. Of AML, yeah, that's right. his car across, um, and then Q sorted it out from there. Anyway, it is a fa- it is pretty much basically an advantage, and it's just um, a, a minor point. But you know, ultimately for Bond fans, they want to know what is the what is the true story. And um, of course, then um, the uh, the skis and the rockets and all those stuff that the special effects team modified it with um, gave it that huge personality. But but the V8 is a, it's an amazing it's an amazing beast, and um, yeah, it's it's great to see that that's back in the new film as well. It was exciting to see that. But I, as much as this is, and it is, a love letter to Aston Martin and your experience of it, I loved your authenticity throughout the entire book. There's, and again, for Bond fans, this is a, a great moment. But when you talk about Skyfall and mm-hmm. the fact that you had to drive this, one of the most amazing moments in Skyfall, the DB5 out of his storage garage. And, you know, even thinking about, you know, how do you have to take the street and how do you organize that? When do you hand it over to Daniel Craig? At what point? What I loved is you actually remarked in the book, hmm, you know, wish wish it wasn't so heavy. You know, I just, I, but I love those little moments because they're so human. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a huge honor to get hold of that car, um, particularly the real thing. 
and particularly because the you know the the cars that um the eon own uh have those modifications and, and you always look at them you never you never know quite which car you're in um they're all slightly different some of them have got the the flip catch on the on the gear stick with the red button right. which i never dare to press um, but you sort of look at it carefully and um, and wonder what it does um so the gadget side of it it really are, are, are fantastic um but at the end of the day it's an old car from 1960s um and you know i love driving it it's such a smooth operator and um a beautiful color the silver birch just um it always looks different in different lights it's so it's a really sort of a living thing the smell of the old leather it's just got so much personality and it's a really really comfortable car to drive um you know on the open road or wherever you are um but yes being greedy you sort of think it could have done with more power um so i really enjoyed uh realizing and finding out that um so Tadek Marek who um had worked on on the des major design elements of the DB5 and the engine in particular um I, I loved finding out that he was tasked with developing the V8 that would power the cars through mm. about two decades of um of Aston Martin's history um and that he smuggled one into a DB5 so um so with a lot of movies that I've worked on the default thing is if you want to spice up a car chase you get a crate V8 motor and you you know you just chop it in um to the engine bay and suddenly you, you get that boosted performance which is exactly what he did with the db5 um and a db5 with a v8 must have been a pretty thrilling package um but only he knew about it because it was his private car except they they did sell it so this is one of the mysteries of um you know there's a one-off db5 original with a v8 engine in it that was sold to a, a private um person Oh my gosh. Must be in someone's garage somewhere. <laughs> and um, that lucky person is sitting on a, a, probably a fortune because it, it's um, it's a unique original piece of kit um, that was probably at least twice as powerful as its um, as its brothers. Amazing. And, and, you know, that's these types of stories is what the book, I think, did very successfully for me, even in the short amount of time, because you literally, and, and please excuse the pun, uh, put people in the driver's seat, even when, you know, again, filming Bond, you know, how this whole thing of when you're walking towards, you know, a DB5 um, and you you get into the seat, but of course it's been hatched up a little bit and you yeah. go in and the top part, the, the wheel, the leather, everything is there. And then everything down below is bare. There's no yeah. carpeting, there's no fine, but that's movie making. I mean, you you put us in the seat of Bond, behind the scenes, which is incredibly successful. Great. Well, I mean, the, what's amazing with the, uh, particularly the special effects um, guys. So Chris Corbold um, runs the, the Bond special effects team yeah. and uh, they are, they've got wonderful um, common sense engineering um, from the, the genius end the book end to the, if you gave them a piece of string and a cotton bud, they could make something work. Um, and I think that's what's incredible to be around is that they've always got some um, solutions and and working with um, the Aston Martin team, they um, collectively um, went on this this venture to create a, a stunt version of the DB5. So uh, the, the result is this stunning, it's very bare inside, but from the outside, it looks completely real. Um, and, um, you know, I think gives it, it because it's lightweight but with more power it's got that incredibly dynamic handling um, but it again harkens back to what um, Tadek Marek was doing in the 60s with his with his V8 so um, these engineers have all got a lot in common and I think um, I love the way that that there's this um, natural handshake between um, the movie side and the car guys um, um, but of course you know a lot of the uh, SFX guys are such gearheads as well that um, it's it's natural for them anyway to to be constantly tweaking stuff. I love that part of the book when you talk about you know one of the first times you know leading up to Quantum of Solace when you go to the track and um, you know you're you're in front of the effects guys and obviously the stunt guys and Lee and people like that and they basically just say yeah Ben go ahead go go see what it can do yeah you know just go tear it up and. Uh, I think it, there was a quote in there that you said, well, you know, for the sake of science, of course, I'll I'll kind of push it a little bit beyond the limit, which is phenomenal. But I have a question that wasn't answered in the book, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you're you're sitting in the car in the movies and you're portraying other people other than Ben Collins. It's a duh statement. But in Bond's case, you obviously have to wear his clothing. I mean, are you measured like Daniel Craig is measured for all of these wonderful, you know, Bondish type kit? Yep. So costume will, 
you know, they're um, absolutely forensic with everything. So um, any, anything that we we're wearing will all be, um, you'll, you'll be, they'll check your sizes and everything. And um, so they'll, that's all, that's all accurate. And um, it's all, it's all repeated. So um, to look the part basically for those, for those scenes. So yeah, that they, they, they absolutely um, get all that sorted. And you've done this so many times, even, you know, four bonds later, does it ever get old or is it exciting every single time? No, I, I love it. I mean, the, the, the teams that we work with are, are world-class and, um, you know, there's, there's always something different. Every script has a new, new challenge. Um, I think, um, you know, this time I think some of the bike guys really got to, to let rip and you can see that in the trailer um, that there's a whole world of, um, of of really cool stuff so I can't wait to see what the final cut looks like um, it's you no know, it's it's always amazing and um, of course you're only as good as what you're doing in that moment and um, you, you can never look back it's always um, what's what's coming so um, yeah I, I, no it certainly never gets old not and not working with those guys it's um, yeah. it's just an absolute privilege and by the way, I mentioned this is 100 years of Aston Martin. You do talk about 2020. You obviously do talk, but you give a taste of the new movie. I actually don't want to mention the new movie at all because I want people to read that chapter. It is so good. And um, the nice thing is there's no spoiler alerts. There's no spoilers at all. You just talk about the experience in much of what we've seen in the trailer, but you put us right into that moment. Um, ben, You've been so good with your time. I do want to end it on a particular note. Yep. And it's literally how you ended the book. And I think I mentioned, you know, you bookended it with your father. You thank your father. I mean, you really, the thank you of, of the inspiration is through your father. We think about this connection of cars and style with this relationship with our, our parents and our family. But you you actually thank the reader, which I don't think I've, I've seen an author do this. You you say, um, and I want to get this right, you say, thank you for accompanying me on this impetuous journey, which if you think about the erratic nature of driving a wonderful car sometimes, it's it's that uncontrolled control. But then you actually end it with, I do hope you get your hands on the merchandise. Yes. What, what, what was that sentiment? Well, I mean, I've got three Aston Martins myself, um, but they're all Hot Wheels. And um, <laughs> so it's... Um, I, you know, every time I get a chance to drive one of those cars, it's always it's always fantastic. And um, you know, of course, um, I, I know that I'm very fortunate, privileged to to get that opportunity in the filming sense and um, to to do it. Um, so of course, I, I really I would love people to have that shared experience. So I hope that they'll enjoy the stories, um, obviously, and um, I hope I've given a, a sense of what it's like driving these things. And um, for, for some people, they may never want to do uh, 180 miles an hour, so that's as, as close as they want to get. Um, but for others, you know, who who want to go and uh, and get their hands on, uh, you know, I I obviously hope that, that people will get to go and en enjoy it for themselves. Of course, there's also the virtual way, which um, with these these amazing new games that you can you can get behind the wheel that way too, and um, and they're replicating them so well. Um, but no, it, you know, it was um, it is a journey, and I I, I think. Um, Hopefully people will rip through it the way you have, maybe not in 36 hours as in, a, in, a, in an all-nighter. Um, and, and yes, and the, what's next for Aston Martin is going to be very interesting because it's um, obviously they've become, a, they've become a public company now. They've got Mercedes investment. They've got um, a new Formula One team um, in right. next yeah. year, powered by Mercedes, which is a yeah. championship winning engine. And um, they've got lots of new cars coming out and they've got this amazing movie that's going to be coming out um, next month. Next month. November. November, um, yeah, right around help, the corner. To help them get things really rocking and rolling um, as we go into uh, the dawn of the electric car really um, taking hold. And um, so hopefully I gave a snapshot of what we might get next year. And it was more of a guess, a bit of a futurism and see what um, we, what, we, what what happens for the company next. But I think if history is a guide, it's going to be pretty awesome. Pretty awesome is right. And by the way, I'll, I'll go back to one thing you just said. Please don't don't read this book in 36 hours. Relish it. You could take it by chapter by. I mean, I would, you know, I would have loved to have had a single malt or you know a nice brandy by it and just sitting there. A lot of us are still in lockdown, even as we're, you're watching this. Um, but we're excited. Uh, just so everybody knows, it's so easy to consume and engage with this book. We're going to put all the links down here below. Check it out in the comments. We'll put our links on the social channel. But Ben Collins, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you. Thanks for reading it. And um, yeah, look forward to keeping in touch on uh, on new developments. But thanks for thanks for your time and um, for, for a great review. Thank you.
My pleasure. This has been David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience. We'll see you all real soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from The Bond Experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.